Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Now, preface this, I've been on sabbatical with this podcast for quite some time, and that came from the fact that I felt like I covered almost everything out there. But enough has changed that, frankly, I think we're going to be revisiting a lot of old topics from taxation to corporate structure to accounting to everything. I expect to see this schedule start to pick up and be more regular very shortly. But in order to kick it off, I'm happy to kick this off with something not finance related, but operationally related. I have Andrew Evans, founder of our office with me, and he is going to talk to you about outsourcing to a virtual assistant, specifically how his company operates and what it does and how you should be thinking about reaching out for virtual assistants in the future. And with that, here's my interview with Andrew. Andrew, thanks for taking the time today. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, so Andrew Evans of our office, tell us about our office. So our office, so I, we have, let's not do the, the typical uh, comment. I'll say it like this. Zero regulated firms are properly staffed. You either have too much or you have too little. And advisors have law, start to lose their ability to properly service clients efficiently. And a lot of that is because they have no capacity to do so with the additional regulations or tools or we'll say things that are put upon them that they have to do themselves now in our current day and age. And with that is that's where we come in. Our office then steps in as a place for any advisor or firm to really right size their personnel, buy or sell your capacity. I need more help on portfolio creation, but I don't have time to plug everything into Morningstar. Hire that out. Or I've got a full-time planner, but I don't have full-time work for them. Sell off that capacity. Go Airbnb about it. That's really our general take on it is right-size your personnel and get yourself properly staffed, increase your capacity or, or put it where it needs to be. Yeah, let me just go back and, and clarify. Uh, basically, you're specifically working in my industry, in the financial advisory industry. So that's why you're talking so much about this. But frankly, a lot of what we're going to talk about, almost everything we're going to talk about, applies in general to any business and virtual assistants in general. Is that about right? That's true. Yep, absolutely. I think we we don't have we don't have as an industry we don't really have uh, uh, different business problems than anybody else. We have different regulatory problems. We have different privacy concerns. I've got a good friend. He works at Google and is part of all of their search and data. And he tends to say, boy, I wish we had more regulation because when I tell him about the regulation we have, he goes, well, that would be great if we had that. Yeah. Across the board, I think we have more of a regulatory and privacy issue over top of what are normal everyday business concerns. Okay. So very valid. All right. So let's talk about virtual assistants. I will say that I end up Refer to con uh, referring to concept of virtual assistance quite frequently when talking to advisors when they're talking about difficulties they're having scaling because too often the concept of what it is to expand the team is binary. It is a full human being or it is no one. So talk to me about, and I always say virtual assistants are the beautiful middle ground where you basically get to have a quarter, three quarters, whatever else it is that you need before you make the commitments. Talk to me about that decision-making thinking and that, 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 that way of thinking about when to look out for, when to look to hire a virtual assistant. Yeah, so that, I think we, it's fun to talk about that question of it's, because that's been the solution is you either go from nothing to a fully burdened employee um, and with the costs and time and so forth. So we typically look at it in, in terms of a conversation starter or when you sit down and you're sitting in front of Redtail, okay? The, and uh, th this is just my, this is my anecdote. You're sitting in front of Redtail and you say to yourself, okay, I've got 250 clients and the holidays are coming. I now need to do the holiday um, greeting card and cookie distribution. Okay, 
do you really want to sit there and do that? Or do you want to, or do you want to be having your appointments with your clients to talk about planning for the next year? You want to meet with those clients, but it's at that point when you look at what is otherwise, we'll call it a client service or more of a mundane task. As soon as a mundane task comes into your head, that's when you know it's time to hire somebody fractionally. Because if we're talking about the cookie list, that'll be my, I might carry that on throughout our entire discussion. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the cookie list, do you really need to hire somebody at, for 35,000 a year, 65,000 a year to do your cookie list and then sit around for the rest of the time? No, but you, it would make more sense to buy a few blocks of time from somebody. Hey, I want to buy five hours of your time. Uh, I'll give you access, proper channels, disclosures. You have access to my red tail, pull the list, scrub it for people who are active, and then take that, upload it into the Harry and David website, track it down, give me the bill. Great, done, moving on. I, I just give that to somebody to do. I gave them the list. They do it. That's the end of it. Excellent. So. Yeah. And let's face it, there's always work in the business where you're just like, I wish I had time for this thing to get done. So you find yourself either doing, quote unquote, less mission critical work than the mission critical work, taking away from your revenue generating abilities, or that work being done after hours, because effectively you're, or some work being done after hours, because you don't have enough hours in the day, or gets passed on, or just gets, gets forgotten or not done altogether. So it is a nice way to basically find the help you need without committing the full body. All right. So where do you feel to your experience? What's the mentality? What point do people get to before they realize they need that kind of help? Oh, it's, they, it's difficult. I think if you, any advisor right now who listens to this to say, to say that, no, no, I've got it all figured out. They don't because there's always something that, that pops up that you weren't expecting. So I think it's more of a rationalization uh, of acceptance of, can I really do this myself? Can I really do this myself? Should I do this myself? And I think they break down. So the, a, a tipping point would be um, CE is due. You have to do an, a, an, an annual mailing. You don't have enough appointments booked. You're trying to hit an asset, new asset target. You're trying to now get your plans out the door. Oh, by the way, your in-laws are coming to town and, oh, I don't know, your annual renews are up. Okay. So uh, I'm picking things off the top of my head that just happen. And out of all of these things, there's a lot here that I could just hand off to somebody to do while I just focus on, say, dealing with my in-laws and, and getting plans out the door. There's no reason that I have to be worrying about pressing the buttons to get my registration done, to book myself for a CE. I can have somebody else just take care of that. I can hire somebody else to call through my client list to book appointments. It's no different than, which I think is a very efficient business, dentist office. They're great at having their office manager just pick up the phone and start to call through and say, hey, it's been X months since you're cleaning. Let's get you booked go on this time. But is that person cleaning your teeth? No. Does that person know your intimate details of your health history? No. Is that person going to give you direction on, I don't know, of your proper gum care? No. They're just making phone calls to book an appointment so that the dentist calendar is filled. The same thing should apply with advisors. You don't, and you don't need to hire somebody full-time to do that. You can hire somebody on, on, on a part-time, on a fractional basis that you give them access to the client list and numbers and they make phone calls and then they put them on your calendar. And what's that going to cost you a, a month? Maybe 500 bucks. But that 500 bucks leads to, let's call it 30 appointments with your clients to do annual reviews to help them satisfy what they need. And you'll probably find some more opportunities. You'll probably get more referrals that way because you have somebody at a very low to you actively giving them that touch point. Um, I might rant here and you guys might want to chop this up, but many times we've all been in a practice management meeting where they talk about the best practices of client touch or whatever is you do this on this date, this on this date, this one week and three weeks and two months, and you just have to build this process and here's your spreadsheet and do it. Most advisors look at that and say, I'm never going to do any of that because it's too much. But 
with hiring somebody on a fractional basis that you only need, say, for four hours a week, you could hire them, give them that that master spreadsheet of what whatever TAMP told you to do this or whatever practice management company told you to do this and say, here, do that. And that's their job. And you don't have to worry about it. You're just going to provide some content. You're going to provide some direction, but now you've outsourced it. You didn't have to hire that. You didn't have to hire a social media manager graduate out of Virginia Tech at 85,000 a year. You hired John Smith over in Oklahoma, who is providing this service at $35, $45, $65 an hour, and you're only using them 10 hours a month because that's all you need. Mm -hmm. So that's my rant. Like it, it's, you don't have to overthink all of these massive plans that practice management people put at you. You'll never get to it. Excellent. Okay. So you talked about the buying or selling of services. What do you do on the actual buying of services in this regard? Do oh, people um, come to you with a virtual, out, virtual assistants come to you and say, Hey, I've got excess hours or do advisors or people in the marketplace come to you and try to trade off their hours? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that, that's exactly what happens. We're actually in talks with many people right now. There's, a, there's actually a growing amount of people that want to fractionally provide uh, paraplanning services. And we're all about that. We want to be that connector to help them find advisors that need a paraplanner. Where we step in, though, in, in all of these things, we do take a level of compliance for that because you can't just sign up. Your firm needs to know what's going on. You are sharing some data there, but let me put that to the side for a second. But we do have a lot of PR people, media folk, people who have been in the industry for many years who just say, you know what, I don't really want to work for somebody. I just want to work for myself. Transition assistants, people who love doing transitions, they come to us and they're starting to sign up with our service for us to help connect them to firms and individual advisors to then hire them. So we, it's not like we reinvented the wheel here. It's along the lines of using a Lyft or Airbnb is that we're trying to be that marketplace to put people with skills that have capacity in front of people that don't have that skill or have a need that don't want to pay for it full time. But a lot of people are coming out of the woodwork to say, but I've got an extra 10 hours to, to offer. I've got an extra five. I can, I'm only working part-time now at XYZ. I can work another part-time with you and I can work with a max of four advisors. It's happening. It's very interesting. We are in a gig economy. So we're trying to advance that forward and help people meet each other. And it's interesting too, because I'm wondering, has anyone come to you yet basically saying, look, I took on a staff member. And we have excess capacity. Maybe I could take it, have them take out some hours from you. Because I look at that as maybe that's the other way around. Is instead of waiting to hire that person, maybe I actually have part of their salary covered by generating revenue by outsourcing their services. That, that's how we started. That's we had myself and and my partner Chris Marsco. He had still has an admin that he's paying full time and very brilliant. And he said, and it was a not. It wasn't that we got it at the exact same time. It's that he said, boy, I just. I'm paying her full time, but I don't really have full time work. And I was like, oh, okay. And then with my travels and in my background working with a lot of advisors, a lot of these advisors were saying, boy, I really need an admin, but I don't really want to pay for someone full time, but I want someone who already knows these systems. So it was all, we were all in the same firm at the same time. And so Chris and I think that's when the light bulb went through. They go, hey, wait a minute. If she's got an extra 20 hours to give, Okay, because she's not working, and Chris and I talking through it. I said, well, "Great, let's let's provide that twenty hours to these other people, and we put a max that she couldn't go over sixteen hours. So everybody picked off what they did. We did the billing to them. It paid to us. I paid that to Chris. Chris offset the salary. That's how we did it. So she didn't. So even though she had more, and this is for the business owners out there." Even though she had more work to do that wasn't technically that advisor's work, she's still being paid for that amount of capacity of work. It's, I don't think humans are machines, so please don't think that. But if I have a machine that is designed to make 50,000 units of whatever per day, and I'm only using and I'm only making 10,000, well, I'm then going to go out to other manufacturers that you can utilize my 
tool to get your capacity as well. Again, I'm, I don't think humans are machines or that they should be treated like that. It's just that idea of if I'm paying you full time, um, then I'm going to use your time to the best. And if we're going to then outsource your capacity to the, this person, whatever revenue comes in, and we tell advisors this now, and we have two others that are doing this, when that, capa- when that revenue comes in, it's just offsetting your salary, Okay. And I know a lot of people would much rather just work a third of the time, but get paid for 100% of the time. I get that. However, if you're employed by this person that's paying your benefits, that's all part of it. So we're agnostic to how somebody wants to do it. You can offset salary or you could pay it out directly to them. It doesn't matter to us. Okay. All right. So talk to me about the security aspects of this, because if I'm passing along client information, there are concerns about making sure that is a secure transfer and that the person I'm passing it off to isn't just going to abscond with it. How do you address those concerns? Yeah. So for anybody that, that wants to be a part of our, anybody who wants to join our platform, any provider, as we call them, that's our nomenclature is a virtual, a virtual assistant is a provider. So any provider that wants to join, first and foremost, we actually do a full background check with them utilizing the national company called Checker. So we want to know about them. We do a light, a very soft credit check on them, an employment check, residential check, because we're only dealing with US-based providers. Mm-hmm. That's another major thing. So we do a pretty solid background check which we would provide to anybody. So we know that they are who they are. They are US based. And then the kind of the other side of that is, and this goes firm by firm, some firms ask that we have an agreement in place so that we understand who's engaged where. Is it the advisor's responsibility? Is it the firm's responsibility? Is that provider's responsibility? So we delineate that with a firm as to how do you want to work with us? RIAs don't aren't necessarily that uh, concerned. They're pretty good at accepting that. Um, but background check, get a solid agreement with that firm, and then we do check ins uh, with both sides as business is going along. Meaning, okay, how to the provider? How are you being treated? Are you being talked to appropriately? Are you being given work that is appropriate for you to do? On the flip side of that, talking to the advisor who contracted for the time. How is the work product? Is this being delivered how you want it to be? Also, we screen the advisors that want to access our marketplace because we also have some concerns over people who we'll do it, we'll do a we'll do a broker check on them because now we're concerned like we don't want to be allowing too many advisors on that say uh, have been uh, overly suspended by FINRA or have a ton of tax liens that have a history of non-payment, have a history of termination for failure to produce and things like that. Because again, we want to take that level uh, back to our providers to make sure that they are also going to get paid. So a little bit down a, a rabbit hole there for you. But then the other thing too is we will help them receive. If the firm's cybersecurity policy doesn't cover the this person that they hired, it typically does, all right, honestly and truly, it, it typically does, then we provide an outlet for that provider to also have cyber coverage through us, or some of them actually come in with their own coverage. And we actually ask for verification of that as well. All right. Oh, so you lock it down. On, on security, any of, the, any of the systems that any provider is given access to is being given access to by that advisor. So if you're getting access to Redtail, you're getting it from that advisor. So we also say to that advisor, remember, you're still the administrator of your business. You still need to maintain control over what is yours, over your e-money, your Redtail, your Riskalyze, your Morningstar. And if you feel like something isn't right, you have the ability to turn it off. That's still on you, the advisor, to figure that out. Excellent. So still, at the end of the day, the security controls are all held by the person delegating. Yep. Excellent. And, and that's always, that's the way it's always going to be. Excellent. So <clears throat> give me a second. I'll let this part out. Okay. All right. So you actually got ahead of me there. I was going to ask about the technical security aspects, but you beat me Sorry. to it. All right. So let's talk about, for someone who's never done this before and is a little bit frightened by it, like, what do you, what would you say to them in order to get them going? First, I'd say, don't panic for all of our Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy friends out there. Don't panic. 
Do the due diligence first. Take some time. Um, think about what it means to have a virtual provider and what are the actual tasks that you would have that person do. So just literally think, what are they going to do? And um, a little cerebral, but then think about what are you doing now as an advisor that is anything different than what that person is asking to do? Does that person really need to be physically in your office? Do you really need somebody to physically open and close doors inside of your? And if the answer is no, if you realize that there's no physical reason that task in your mind that needs to be done by a human in your office, then that is your first step to say, I'm ready to gain somebody on a virtual basis. To which I'd say to also all of your listeners, if you have ever utilized a, an internal wholesaler, they've actually been acting almost as a virtual assistant to you, especially with a lot of the insurance companies. I need, I need an illustration. I need this paperwork. I'm, I need this pre-filled, so on and so on. Very few of the things that we actually do as advisors are a physical labor in your office anyway. So just take that into perspective, but take your time. Do due diligence on what are the tasks that you don't want to do that have no requirement for a physical person in your office to do them. Once you have that, now do a simple Google search. I mean, seriously, just Google what that person does. See who else is out there. See what else uh, has happened at other firms. And you'll find very quickly that hmm, you're, you're in a place that people are already doing this. This is a very common, it's very common. A lot of firms are, uh, a lot of major firms already work remotely anyway. It's just that they're, they're an employee. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> this is a great way to get started. So basically, Andrew, thank you very much for taking the time today. Greatly appreciate it. And where can people find you when they want to find, when they want to seek you? So for us, our the website, ouroffice.team. So that's the letter R, office. You could find us there. And then please find me on LinkedIn. Look me up, Andrew J. Evans. I do full and fair disclosure. I have two, dis I have two profiles because I do maintain a registered investment advisory firm. Full and fair disclosure. You do those things. You learn those things. Everything that we learned there is how we learned that what more and more can be outsourced virtually. So either, either company might be R&D for the other. I don't quite know yet. But find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter. Hey, find me on the gram. I'm there. You can see pictures of my dog. It's great. Excellent. I go to Disney World a lot. You'll love it. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. All the best. Thanks. So that was today's episode. Of, so that was today's episode of Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. Hope you find that enjoyable. If you're in the US or if you're actually just looking, if you're in Canada looking to work with an outsourced provider in the space, absolutely zero reason why you should be looking, you shouldn't be looking at dealing with someone like Andrew's company. And okay, before you go there, there is no law that prevents Canadians from having data stored on a foreign server. Go back and listen to my interview with Bamboo Consulting. We will just spell that in it. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.